OK, it's eight o'clock, so we're going to get started because we're under a tight uh, time schedule this morning, and uh, I'll start by wishing everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. And may the. Best of your past days be the worst of your future ones. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully everybody will get to enjoy a green beer later tonight. So um, we're going to start out um, by swearing in the team from RRMC. And um, Claudio, who is going to be uh, speaking today for from RRMC? No, I may not have Claudio. <clears throat> Claudio, are you there? Well, this could be problematic. <laughs> Judy, are you there? Doubly problem problematic. Joe, you're going to have to do all the talking. Oh, this that would be a nightmare, Kevin. <laughs> it might make the hearing go quicker. <laughs> it probably would be. <laughs> do you know if they're tied up with something right now? or? Uh I'm surprised they weren't here since they had provided me all the information, their presentation, the links. So, uh, uh, well, I, I Claudio shows I, up as being part of the meeting, but he just doesn't seem to uh, be responding. Huh. Kara, can you give uh, them a call on their uh, landline and see uh, what's cooking? Are you there, Kara? Yes, sorry. Okay. Calling. Thanks. <laughs> Kevin, I know this This is Mike Del Treco. I know we just finished a hospital leadership meeting, so that's um, Claudio might be just dialing at the moment. Yeah, it's just that we're time pressed this morning because they have another commitment at 10, so we'll just have to get as much done as we can. While we're waiting, Kevin, can I just ask a process question? It doesn't look like on the agenda we're noticed for a vote, so I wasn't sure if that what the expectation was around that today. I know that there's a tight statutory deadline. So I think the uh, um, the rule that uh, we're operating under, and I'll ask the legal team to uh, for their uh, advice on this, but. I think that the requirement that we had was for the staff to um, uh, do an analysis and make a recommendation to us within 15 days, which they did do. Um, so, uh, okay. Mike or Russ, are you on? Hi, this is Russ. I'm on. And and you're right. That's the 15 days is set in um, guidance in the board's adjustment policy, and then. Hi. In that Hi. same guidance, it says. Uh, are, are, are Judy and Claudio trying to get on the call? OK. That says the board will vote as okay. soon as yes. possible. Okay. Thereafter. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanting to get the lay of the land. Sorry, Russ, can you just repeat the last sentence that you said? I was I couldn't quite hear with two people talking. Can you say the last yeah, sentence sorry. again? Um, the guidance that we have for budget adjustment says the staff will produce a recommendation within 15 days of receipt of the request, and then the board will um, take it up as a vote as soon as uh, possible thereafter. Okay, great. Thank you. 
So we do have time, Robin. Thanks. Claudia, are you with us? Hey, good morning, folks. Can you hear me? We can. We thought maybe you were going to uh, do a Ferris Bueller on your own hearing. <laughs> well, my apologies, folks. I have a little new technology and uh, I thought I had it down, but I it's beyond my scope. So hopefully we can uh, we'll get back to basics. Uh, Judy Fox is uh, she was going to be presenting with me in my office. She's going she's retreating to her office, so she's logging on right now. Um, and we are ready to go. My apologies for the delay. And and you can see that uh, Joe Krause, uh, I see is on the call. Our uh, our board chair has joined us this morning as well for this. So um, we appreciate yeah, your this absence. Opportunity. I had uh, told Joe that he was going to have to do the presentation. We came we came we came close, Mr. Chair. Um, so so uh, um, as soon as Judy gets on, if she could just acknowledge that so that uh, Kim can swear you both in. I'm okay. I'm here. OK, great. Kim, if you could swear them in. Would you please raise your right hands? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. Thank you. OK, with that, uh, Claudio, we'll jump right into it because I know that you're on a uh, time schedule here this morning. Okay. So whenever you're ready, take it away. So we should be. We, we do see the slides. If there's any way you could put it into presentation mode, it would be great. I'm going to do that right now. All right, let me. Let me do that if right not, now. We have them anyway, so. OK. Um, Can you see that now? We yeah. can. Yep. OK. OK, um, my apologies again for the technology. Um, we have a few slides to walk through uh, to support the filing that we made with you. Um, Judy's going to run through most of these. A lot of them run through uh, the financial impact and where we see ourselves today and where we project we are going to be at the end of this uh, fiscal year and uh, kind of walk you through the rationale for uh, um, where we feel we need to be with a interim rate increase request. So Judy, I will turn this over to you. Sure, good morning everyone. So I think we just lost the slides. Claudio, I'll show my screen. Can you do that, Judy? For some I reason, it. I am just having the worst morning. I got it. We're good. Can everyone see my screen? We can. All right. So I just wanted to anchor this morning's conversation um, in where we are projecting. This is not new information uh, to the staff or you as a Green Mountain Care Board. This is the same information that we have been talking about um, and sent with our letter of intent. So based on the first five months of the year, so this is through uh, February of 2022, uh, we are projecting a $7.5 million loss. Um, and we'll, 
will describe kind of how that loss came to be, um, but it is uh, primarily related to uh, uh, salary and the, just the workforce challenges that, quite frankly, all Vermont hospitals are facing. And so with that in mind, um, the seven and a half million dollars, if we look at the, the drivers in terms of the deficit, uh, we do have to offset revenue with expenses, and we have had a very busy first few months of the year, um, and primarily the first quarter of the year, uh, where we saw inpatient COVID uh, patients, an average of about 16 a day. We saw a, a significant increase in lab testing relating to COVID care, uh, amounted to over a half a million dollars a month in variants. And then a really strong ED, where our ED volume was up over 16%. Um, in addition, uh, we did receive phase four funding uh, from the federal government. We received about $6.5 million. We also received a, sec a second tranche of FEMA funding at about 750,000. So we do have additional revenue to offset our expense. Unfortunately, uh, with the inflationary uh, issues related to both pharmaceutical supplies, but primarily workforce, not enough to overcome those inflationary uh, drivers. So when we look at our staffing expense, we've got $35 million of staffing expense that we're projecting through the end of the year, um, with about a third of that in temporary staffing. And we're gonna, we're gonna spend some time there. Um, we have base rates and minimum wage. We did move our minimum wage up to $15 an hour. Um, and then we have incentive plans. Um, we have, uh, at the height of COVID, had over 200 vacant positions, half of which we would call direct patient care. Uh, we had incentive plans in place to uh, really incentivize our staff to pick up ec extra shifts. We had almost 70,000 hours of incentives. Uh, that our staff uh, was um, willing to, to pick up. And honestly, it's what kept our doors open and uh, allowed us to keep services going. On the non-staffing side, what we're really seeing is that cost of pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're seeing inflationary uh, you know, demands there. You're gonna see that in our modeling and our uh, rate increase. And we have continued COVID expenses related to door access, you know, facility control, um, Lab, laboratory testing, those types of things. Overall, what we're seeing is if you compare our projected staffing costs to our budget, we're over 25 per, or 27%, so uh, very difficult to overcome. And looking at travelers in particularly, uh, we're, we're challenged in travelers in two fronts. We need more than we had projected in our budget. Uh, we had projected we have about 20, uh, travelers in our budget. Uh, at last count, we had 51. Um, and so the demand for traveler you know, presence here at the hospital um, is, is twofold. Uh, and then the, the cost of a traveler has gone up, depending on what the skill set of that traveler is we're looking for, has gone up between 250 and 300 percent. I can show you, you know, that bottom graph shows the individual rates where an ED uh, nurse was coming in at about $70 an hour pre-pandemic um, and is about 180 to 190 now. Uh, the impact of both that need for more travelers and the cost is really driving a significant increase in our, um, our cost. Um, and that cost is $16.8 million. That's total cost. We had budgeted about $5 million uh, of that. And so you can see that $11 million deficit really driving a significant portion um, of our loss. When we look at the impacts of this comp plan, um, the inflationary pieces, both in uh, supplies and uh, workforce, we are seeing a significant increase in where you know we measure costs by expense per adjusted discharge. We had been doing fairly well pre-pandemic. It was a focus of ours. Um, and then you can see the purple bar here is the first effects of COVID. Um, and certainly uh, the orange bar is where we are today. Um, and we'll tell you that COVID has been much more challenging uh, in the last five, six months uh, than it was in the first uh, 
you know, part of the, uh, of the um, pandemic. But what's really important to understand is that although our costs are going up, it's not because we're inefficient. And this is what the graph on the right hand side. So this graph shows our productivity and it, it looks at our FTEs per adjusted occupied bed. So how many people do we have here on site all in, including caregivers, administrators, clerical, um, to take care of our patients? And what you can see is that, um, you know, significant decline um, in what we call efficiency or productivity or increase in efficiency um, and productivity. Um, and this is really, you know, uh, a testament to our to our staff because even with this decline, we kept doors open. We did not delay services. Uh, we did not, uh, you know, shut shut down any services. And it was because we had our staff here. We had our incentive plans, you know, and we're able to um, invest in it, as well as our staff commit to taking care of you know the patients. And so when we look at how did this come. Uh, it's driven by our vacant positions. And so here you have a four year look at vacancies and job postings here at the hospital uh, beginning in September of 2019. You know where we, we had you know minimal uh, average, I would say uh, it, uh, postings, a lot of you know just regular turnover to where we are today and in the height of you know September 21 we had over 200 job postings um, by the time we get to February 22 that's down to about 160 65 job openings um, part of this is our ability to um, retain and uh, attract in uh, staff with our comp plan our minimum wage had a huge piece in trying to drive down uh, this vacancy but as you can see it's still very very significant and this uh, rn uh, vacancy rate that's what's driving our temporary staff and and so those costs are three times the amount that we would you know normally pay so despite these investments, we're still facing these workforce challenges. Um, we consider this to be our most significant challenge uh, in, operationally. Talk to you about how we've invested in dollars with our staff. Certainly um, that has been a, a, a focus and a priority, but we are also looking at ways in which we can partner in our community. We can foster relationships with um, educational institutions, whether that's you know at the high school level or um, you know at the college level, and we've really stepped up um, our focus on how we can uh, attract. Uh, new talent to the hospital, how we can um, get uh, students in the pipeline early, working with Stafford Tech, um, and then you know, looking also at the, old, the, the other end of the spectrum with returning adult students and how we can attract them into our workforce, primarily looking at our LNA programs. So we have really spent a, a good deal of time. Uh, we have committed to providing clinical expertise um, and faculty at both the VTC level and the Castleton University level. We've opened up our campus to allow for classes to, to be held here on site. Um, and we are um, trying to ensure that we can provide the number of clinical uh, hours and rotations here to really meet our demand. Where we are today, when we look at our new uh, grads who are expecting you know, to graduate in, in the spring here uh, in another few weeks, we have hired 21 new grads. Uh, and those individuals will start uh, throughout the summer months, have a number of pieces that they still have to you know, obtain before they be can become a full RN here. They've got to pass their NCLEX. They've got to pass an orientation period. That orientation period, depending on uh, what type of uh, practice they're going into can be anywhere from you know four to five months to a year if you're an ICU nurse. So I think just let me jump in for a minute. The the takeaway here, folks, is we're not just sitting back and and looking for additional rate to solve this problem. That's uh, the interim solution. We have. Um, a whole host of these strategies, as Judy said, on workforce development. 
the challenge is this doesn't uh, you know, provide an immediate relief. Some of these investments take a little time, um, but some of these uh, reconnecting with the pipeline and expanding the pipeline of nurses. I know the legislature has been helpful in that, um, but that's one of the reasons why we need uh, some of this relief to let these investments take place. We recognize none of the other um, key areas we're focused on happens without workforce. Workforce is really job one. So when we talk about quality and finance and patient satisfaction and employee satisfaction, it all hinges on rebuilding our workforce. So we're we're making active strides in that. And two additional uh, programs just to highlight our nursing excellence program um, has really reached out to uh, the high school levels here um, and primarily with um, Rutland High School and offering internships to really get these students um, kind of uh, understanding what healthcare fields looks like, what career options look like, and providing a mentoring uh, opportunity. So that's something we're really proud of. And then our OR experience project, which is a, a joint project with VTC, where we are trying to get OR nurses in the pipeline early. Um, we had eight traveling nurses within our OR, and I think we're down to five now, um, but certainly this is a pain point um, and a very, very difficult recruit. Once you get nurses here, there is a long orientation. So this is helpful in getting that onboarding, uh, really mitigating that time frame. And so where you know we wanted to spend some time, I know uh, that you've looked at our first quarter results. Our first quarter results uh, came in uh, you know, fairly strong in terms of uh, the pandemic and the challenges we had with workforce. Uh, but the first quarter is really not uh, predicting where we're going to end the year. Um, and for a couple of reasons. So we did see that strong volume in the first quarter. I will tell you that that has softened uh, quite substantially across the house broadly. Uh, we have seen our uh, COVID testing, you know, go down to to almost non-existent. We were seeing, you know, a half a million dollars of revenue there. Um, our COVID volume inpatient um, at the height of um, this last, uh, you know, surge, we had 24, 25 patients a day, and now we're running between two and three patients uh, in house a day. We have seen a softening in our uh, ED utilization as well. We also have, um, you know, over the two plus years of uh, COVID, we were able to uh, uh, retain some federal funding and state funding. Uh, we have exhausted all funds um, and we have been fairly aggressive in looking for funds coming in. Uh, we have uh, utilized the FEMA program, the state program, the federal program, um, but now as of February, we have recognized all of that uh, income. And so uh, we're just uh, on our own in terms of being able to support our cost structure. What we do know is that rates alone are not going to solve our, our, our financial performance. Um, it is too difficult to put on a rate increase. Um, and so there's a, a very focused effort. And this graph, I think, really illustrates that, that we are very committed that as we see revenue go down, we really need to match that with uh, reductions in expenses. And so you can see that orange line is really running kind of a parallel with um, revenue and us really trying to make sure that uh, we are flexible and can adjust uh, to volume. One of the biggest pieces of that is our incentive program as we begin to try to pull that back a little bit in terms of who's eligible and the, um, the amount of incentive that we're providing. Unfortunately, because expenses are running above uh, revenue, what we see is a, you know, a, a fairly drastic operating loss. And um, unfortunately, going into the pandemic, we were not um, exactly a, a high performer in terms of operating margin. You can see that we were, you know, well within uh, $2 million a year. If you were to take our projected loss and take the last five years of performance in aggregate in total, we would have only generated $2.4 uh, million of 
net income. Very, very difficult uh, when you think about uh, pension programs you have to support, debt capacity uh, that also comes into play there. And looking at our balance sheet, um, this is uh, one of the most problematic uh, areas for me, um, and, and that's our days of cash on hand. And I know we've been touted that we have been a high performer. Um, we were at about 280 days. Um, that was somewhat inflated because of our Medicare advance. So we came early to the Medicare program. We requested uh, the advance. We requested the full amount of advance. We received $25 million that did sit in our balance sheet. Uh, all of those funds that were obligated to repay by September of this year. Um, that coupled with just the inflationary costs that are driving uh, the average daily spend up uh, has had a drastic uh, impact in our operating margin, coupled with the fact that Rutland Regional Medical Center, like many other healthcare uh, organizations across uh, you know, the, the, the US, have really used operating, non-operating investment income to subsidize the fact that it's really difficult to generate operating margins. Um, and you can see those performance metrics on the right with investment returns um, and has a, a, a correlating impact on our days of cash, really helping us maintain that. As we see that volatility in the market, as we face some of those market losses, um, that it also has um, a direct impact on cash. So when we look at our uh, 21 performance and uh, look at that compared to our projected 22, that's a 25% decline in our days of cash. And, and that is something that, you know, we are, uh, are concerned about. Um, it does limit our ability to reinvest. <clears throat> it also has implications on our debt covenants. So um, we have always enjoyed a, kind of a safe space, if you will, in terms of our bond covenants. We have three bond covenants that we are held to uh, by both the TD Bank and USDA, uh, whom partner with us. Um, and with the projected losses uh, this year, uh, we are really at risk in the debt service coverage ratio. This uh, debt service coverage ratio is dependent on generating operating income. Um, and so it does force us into this risky area in, uh, for 22 if we cannot mitigate this loss. So we're here today to ask you uh, to support us uh, in, in this. Um, we uh, have really tried to be very open in our communication with you as obligated in our budget order. Um, we did notify you as soon as we understood that there was going to be a significant change in our budget. So we did issue a letter uh, in November, uh, in November. Uh, where we disclosed much of what we've talked about this morning. We have increased volume COVID funding, but unfortunately the expenses have really outstripped our ability to kind of maintain even a break even. Um, we then knew we had a 90 day window uh, to come to you. Um, so we, we sent our second letter, our letter of intent on February 24th. Uh, where we were formally requesting a budget amendment. That amendment is 9% um, re requesting an April 1st effective date. Um, what's important to note here is that um, we've talked about the staffing runs, the $35 million. Uh, we're only asking for 7.4 million of that. Knowing that uh, we had volume increases, we had unanticipated COVID funding, um, and that this is not a year that we can build a bottom line. Um, and so this rate increase would uh, still force us into a small operating deficit, but honestly, it's where we felt comfortable. <clears throat> And then we have responded to a couple of different question uh, sets from uh, Green Mountain Care Board staff. When we talk about rate increases, um, it is becoming increasingly more difficult to try to balance a budget on rate increases. We have uh, too many competing issues. Um, we have a declining payer base who actually pays charges for us. That's about 28% of our volume. 
Um, and we are joining ACO programs. Um, and so uh, as our charges increase, particularly for those commercial payers, um, it does put us in a challenging position uh, in ACO uh, target setting. Um, when we look at our payer rates um, and on average, we're looking at uh, modeling a rate increase for every dollar uh, that we levy in a rate increase on the inpatient side, we only collect about 16 cents. The outpatient side, a bit more competitive, um, a bit more commercial, uh, 25 cents on the dollar. Um, and we've talked about you know, market constraints. I will tell you, we have um, took the opportunity to look at our rates compared to other Vermont hospitals. We all now have to publish our rates uh, with the pricing transparency. So we were really trying to make sure that we uh, were not out of line um, and uh, modeled a rate increase uh, that was more consistent uh, with, with other Vermont hospitals. So what we ended up with, um, again, is a 9% rate increase. This is a targeted rate increase. This is not across the board. This 9% generates a little under $32 million of gross revenue, uh, where you see minimal impacts on the inpatient side, 4.7, $27 million on the outpatient side. Uh, that $32 million generates about $7.4 million of net income, or roughly 23 cents on the dollar. Um, we were very uh, concerned about uh, driving patients away from primary care and supportive care services. And so as we looked at our rate increase, we were uh, very um, uh, deliberate in looking at laboratory services, um, uh, endoscopy services, uh, those uh, services that are diagnostic um, and are really a tool set for our primary care physicians. Uh, so we did limit rate increases in some of those areas. Areas we had opportunities uh, are within pharmaceuticals. We've seen um, significant inflationary increases in pharmacy. We have not raised rates uh, in, in um, correlation or in direct response to some of those increases. So we were able to look at the impact of rate increases and bring those into our pharmacy and supply uh, tiering structure. And our last slide is just looking at our historical rate uh, increase. <clears throat> so we have um, enjoyed the, the kind of position of being um, historically lower than Vermont averages for a number of years. Um, we have had, um, you know, the ability to really um, have great conversations with the Green Mountain Care Board and put together, you know, a, a, a reasonable uh, approach to our budgets. Unfortunately, uh, those lower rates have really limited our ability to generate an operating margin. Uh, and just going back to that slide where we look over the past five years, our total operating margin is 2.4%. Um, with that, it just does not allow us uh, the ability to uh, take on these inflationary uh, pieces and uh, meet the workforce challenges without looking at higher rates. Uh, so we did come to the difficult uh, conclusion and decision that we did need to go back to the rate payers and we did need to um, increase uh, rates in order to react to these inflationary pressures. With that said, you know, we still would be, um, you know, within uh, the averages and, and medians of Vermont State Hospitals. So that's our that's our story. Um, happy to take questions. Great, thank you, Judy. And uh, I do think it's appropriate that we do the questions before we go to the staff presentation because you have that ten o'clock uh, hard stop. I understand. And uh, Claudio, if we're not uh, finished with um, public comment and other things by ten, we'll finish that up. But we won't. Uh, get into uh, the discussion or decision making phase until um, we can have you back with us so that you're not missing anything. And that would likely be next Wednesday as we're trying to figure out everyone's schedules. I don't know how that would work for you, but um, 
that's what I'm looking at. Maybe by some miracle we get done by 10. Um, I'm just not always that optimistic. <laughs> so hopefully that's OK with you, Claudio. Yeah, we'll make that work. OK, so I'll start out with a few questions just to kick things off, and I just want to start out with a comment. Um, Judy, on that slide, if you could put it back up about the lower than average uh, increases. And, and basically my comment here is that. Um, and I don't mean this to be upsetting because I, I want you to realize that uh, the Green Mountain Care Board does acknowledge the tremendous pressures that are being faced by all hospitals um, due to the workforce crunch. And it's something that that uh, nobody had envisioned the uptick in cases back last summer when we were discussing budgets. And, and if we had anticipated that, then you would have asked for more and we gave you exactly what you asked for. But on this particular chart, Judy, um, when I look back um, five years ago, um, you had the the highest total cost of care per patient in the state. And I really thought that you had been self correcting and moving in the right direction by um, coming in with lower than average uh, increases over the last several years. So um, yes, you would be um, commended for doing that. But in some respects, when you start out as one of the highest uh, costs of care in the state, um, it's still it's not something that uh, I really would uh, congratulate you on. Um, Claudio, have you reached out to the carriers? We've heard in past mid-year um, requests that um, from carriers that they weren't going to um, uh, rubber stamp a mid-year increase. And I'm curious if you've had conversations with your payers to uh, see if that uh, um, is in fact, uh, uh, are they willing to acknowledge the unique circumstances that people are in? Um, we we have not done that, Kevin. Um, we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves in the process. We wanted to go, you know, uh, the process was we present this to our board, um, uh, have the hospital board make a determination. Then second step is to the Green Mountain Care Board. You are regulator. Have you make a determination on where we're at and then we'll go to our payers. We have reviewed our payer contracts about um, uh, looking at that, but we have not talked th to them about this in advance of meeting with you. OK, there was one circumstance where we approved a mid-year increase for a hospital, but then um, the carriers were making it clear to them that they weren't going to uh, be looking favorably towards uh, an increase in the next year's uh, budget. So I just want to make sure that these conversations are occurring because um, I'm assuming that uh, you know this isn't the end of what you're going to be asking for. Maybe I shouldn't assume that. You know what happens when I assume anything. Um, you had some great slides, and thank you for uh, you know the the work that you're doing with the educational institutions. And I was curious um, on the embedded um, staff with faculty. Are you paying um, their their salaries, or is Castleton? Oh, we are. And are you paying at uh, a rate that's above the Castleton uh, rate for their faculty so that people aren't being penalized for um, teaching the next generation of students? Yeah, we're paying our our stand our given rate for these staff to support some of these extended teaching assignments. OK, on the precepting end, it, it looks like you've opened up uh, additional space, but of course the bottlenecks uh, for future nurses, when we look at uh, what we're hearing, 80% um, of the qualified students uh, turned away from Vermont Tech, 75% at UVM, um, because there just isn't uh, the faculty or the precepting space to uh, all allow those programs to expand. Um, have you maximized what you're able to do on the precepting end? 
uh, yeah, I think we're making good strides in expanding those. I don't know if I'd say, you know, I, I think it's something we are focusing on. We'll see what type of, um, you know, a lot of it depends upon where our budget falls out, uh, how much resources we can shift and allocate to some of these areas. But I think there's more work that we can do, and I think there's more opportunity. I think we've made some uh, really important strides um, connecting with especially Castleton, um, Vermont Technical Colleges, and and even down to Stafford, and uh, um, to try to in, enhance the pipeline. I, I think there's I think there's some more work we can do, but I think we've made a great first step. The House uh, has passed a bill out of committee that would uh, allocate some dollars for uh, faculty and precepting. Do you know if Castleton um, has been uh, um, following that closely and if they intend to pursue some of those uh, possible funding opportunities? I, 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 I don't know specifically, Kevin. I. I imagine they are, and, and we certainly are. And when we see that legislation, one of the things that we do know is that we have connected with Castleton. Our nursing leaders are meeting with their nursing leaders. Um, you know, we've had, I've been, you know, met with uh, uh, their uh, past and current uh, interim uh, president, um, and we're making great uh, progress with them um, in, in finding innovative and novel ways that we can expand uh, slots for nurses. So um, I, I can't speak for them, but we're certainly following it very closely. Okay. And we'll make them aware of it if they're not aware. I was heartened to see um, Judy's slide about uh, um, getting expenses under control if revenues uh, start to uh, to decrease. And I'm just curious, um, how much a year are you spending on advertising and marketing? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, it it is a um, fraction of, you know, it's a fraction of a percent probably. It's probably not even a full percent of our annual revenues on this. Um, one of the things that we have done, uh, folks, over the last two years, uh, if you want to call it advertising and marketing. Um, uh, we've really done a lot of community um, health information advertising. We've purchased a lot of purchased ads in the local media um, uh, on cable uh, to talk to our community, to educate them on what is going on with COVID, how they can protect themselves, and to let them know what's happening at the hospital because you know, we made tremendous changes in visitation policies and mask requirements and testing. So we spent a lot of money over the past two years on that. And we we've also upped when we talk about advertising, our help wanted advertising. We've re we've revisited and refocused our um, whole recruitment and onboarding process to start with how we are advertising for staff. So especially out in the social media space, that's where, you know, all the action is today and placing ads for people who are, um, you know, hopefully attracting more people to come to Vermont and to especially to come to Rutland County uh, to find work. So we've been we've been upping our spending in those areas. Um, what you don't see from Rutland Regional is you don't see uh, big ads in the paper for our orthopedic service or so forth. Um, that's not the type of advertising we've been doing. It's been more around community health information and uh, and help wanted advertising. I appreciate that you're spending more for, uh, you know, creating uh, opportunities for people to learn about uh, career opportunities, because I do think that uh, there are some great careers in healthcare that Vermonters can take advantage of. But um, just to give you the feedback, um, when I'm out on the street, what I hear the complaints about is, I know that these are educational um, full page ads that were in the paper, but people wonder why the, the paper wasn't uh, working with you on a, on a uh, better basis just to print that information as news rather than require full page ads and I'll tell you that I hear the the most complaints when people 
and this hasn't happened during the pandemic, but when people see a golf hole being um, uh, sponsored by RRMC or go to a show at the Paramount that's being sponsored by RRMC, um, they just feel that it's inappropriate that um, rates are going up and yet these things are, are being sponsored and they don't see it as a core health core care mission. So I'm just giving you that feedback, not saying I necessarily agree with it, but just making sure that I'm passing it on to you so that you know as well. Well, you, you know, there's the perception and then there's the reality. We can get you the specifics, what we spent on advertising and in what categories. I think the uh, golf uh, tournament hole sponsors for the VNA or for some other local health and social service agencies are pretty nominal amounts for something that uh, you know we're we're not sponsoring for-profit endeavors uh, things like the Paramount Theater and so forth. There is you know our mission is to improve the health of our community, um, and our direct mission isn't to improve the health economic health of our community. Uh, but there is a correlation uh, and, you know, our focus is an economic development, but there is some return on having some of those uh, important not for profit uh, things to our ability, especially now with workforce to attract and retain uh, workforce and to, to bring people to to Rutland. They need more than just the job to be able to come to. And so um, we're we're not spending a, a huge war chest on that. We have spent a lot of money and we have taken out full page ads because with all the channels of information that people get, uh, a lot of this stuff that you know just they're not going to read the 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 fine print in the news article. Uh, they will respond to a full page ad, and we've heard some things that that's been helpful in educating them on what they need to do to stay safe in the pandemic and not have to contract COVID and get hospitalized. So, um, but point taken, I know sometimes even the perception makes your job harder and makes people think that we're not sticking to the knitting. When it comes to reserves, when do you think it's an appropriate time to uh, dip into reserves? Um, I would say we're already dipping into reserves to pay for some uh, things. And um, I will tell you two years ago when the bottom fell out and we didn't know where any relief funding was, um, we were fortunate to have those reserves because we, uh, you know, we and we relied on them to keep our staff together and literally to keep the doors open of the hospital and not have to shut down things. So, you know, what's the right level of reserves? Um, hard to say, but I think um, what we will see is, you know, those things, and you've seen it with some of their other hospitals in Vermont, uh, that can change pretty quickly. And when the stock market um, returns, uh, we're investing those prudently. Uh, but when you know we have such volatility in the market, that can that can change very very quickly. So we've started, and as Judy showed you, we are already spending down some of those returns reserves, uh, paying back Medicare, um, and, and so forth. But as I'm today, proud that we've. Your, oh, what's sorry, your, as of today, what's your total uh, uh, dollar value of investments? That's a so, Judy question. Yeah, so uh, we are somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 210,000. I'm sorry, 210 million. Scared me there for a second, Judy. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we do have bond covenants, you know, so we, we have to be careful of that um, as well. Those 210 days are not all available per se. And, and, and what's I, the margin in that uh, in your bond covenants? Are you close to hitting that uh, that uh, threshold, or do you still have some space? Yeah, so it, it depends on what covenant we look at. So days of cash, uh, we have a, a ninety day covenant. Um, our our pressure point is in the debt service coverage re, uh, ratio because that is really geared toward operating margin um, and available cash flow. 
<clears throat> so in terms of spending reserves, if you look at our um, operating margins over the last few years and you look at um, our debt reserve payments, um, our funding into our principal uh, pension plan and um, investment into, into capital, uh, we need about six million dollars uh, of of income not to go into either relying on investment return or um, as as you put it dipping into reserves thank you appreciate if, that if i could just if i may just add um you know we are a a not-for-profit independent community hospital and two years ago when our board revisited and did a strategic planning process. We looked at that and I think it's never a one and done. I think it's constantly our organization management and governance and our board is always looking at what's going on in the environment and are we stronger as an independent community hospital or would we be stronger and be able to accomplish our mission by joining um, forces and or coming on board with a larger system. At that point in time and at this current point in time, our determination is that uh, the best way for us immediately to accomplish our mission is to be an independent community hospital. Um, and, and with that, there's no safety net. Um, and so we uh, need to be prudent. Um, we need to invest wisely and, and have some cushion for a rainy day. And, and I'll, you know, these, this has been, you know, we've had a rainy two years and Literally, um, I'm really proud of the work that we did, and part of it was because we had we had some of those cushions that we could protect our community. We could be here for the community during those dark days of the pandemic when we had 25 patients, and it was just a it was just a month ago, last month, that we were still, you know, our focus wasn't, you know, our focus was what if we have three critical care patients and there's only two beds and there's no room at the tertiary care facilities and there's no ambulance uh, paramedics to get them there. How do we, what do we do? So, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, I don't want to get too dramatic, but, um, you know, I think we need to have some of those reserves if, if we're going to fulfill our mission as an independent hospital and make the investments and take the risks to fundamentally transform some of our cost structure and how we're delivering care um, in a value-based world. We're, the board said we're an independent hospital, but they directed us to work more closely with our other health and social service agencies in our community to try to coordinate care better. That's where they wanted us to partner more closely. So just to give you a little more background color on, on the thinking behind that. Yeah, don't don't take uh, what I'm saying, my questions as being an argument for uh, having less in reserves. I'm, I'm just uh, asking you some probing questions and trying to pick your brain on uh, what you think the appropriate level is and things like that. And I probably shouldn't say this in a public forum, but as a community member of Rutland, I'm, I'm glad that you've made the decision to stay independent. As Joe knows, I've always believed that you shouldn't put uh, all your eggs in one basket. And when one of his previous employers was uh, being bought out, I was a critic of that, and uh, um, I do like to protect uh, Rutland-based entities. So that's just the hometown boy that can't stop itself from coming out. <laughs> so with that, I'll ask my other board members um, for questions and comments, and I'll go in alphabetical order, starting with board member Jessica Holmes. All right, great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, you know, I'm sure you all can appreciate the tough spot that we're in, right? Trying to balance patient affordability with hospital solvency. And I just want to say I appreciate the tough spot that you're in. Um, you know, these these pandemic days have been dark. It's exhausting. Workforce pressures are, you know, daunting. Margins are declining. I, I understand. So I want to express my my empathy on the front that you're on, and I'm hoping that you can understand the have empathy for the front that we're on. Um, so a couple of questions around um, non-operating revenues this year relative to budget. Um, operating margin, I see you're projecting minus 2.5%. What was your projection for total margin? 
Yeah, so that is uh, the risk in this projection. Uh, we are not projecting significant losses in our um, investment portfolio. And so we are assuming uh, that we will kind of tread water for the rest of the year. So what does that exactly mean? Like what is your exact, I mean, total margin estimate? So we are, uh, we have assumed losses through February and we haven't assumed any greater losses from February through September in investments. We've realized actual losses in the projection. Okay. Um, all right. So, Jessica, did that second. answer your question or did you want to know? Not number? really. I don't feel like I have a number on what your total margin is. Judy, do we have the projection for total um, with investment income? for the end of the year? So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a $4 million, um, six, $4 million investment loss as of February. We would append that to the $7.5 million loss that we're projecting to come in at $11, $12 million loss for the year. That's if we just break even on our investments for the rest of this year. Okay. Correct. <clears throat> Okay. Um, so in the in the questions that you all answered, I guess this was March 11th. Um, you talk about uh, this was your answer here. If the rate increase is not approved, we may be required to make difficult decisions to limit certain clinical services. Unfortunately, the services that result in operational losses are services that are highly linked to primary care and are therefore services that would likely have broader utilization and cost implications. So I guess I'm, I want to understand a little bit more about the process by which uh, you would choose which services to cut and the criteria you would use if the board didn't grant the rate increase. And then specifically, I'm trying to understand here how much weight you would give to community need versus service line profitability and trying to figure out how you go forward if the board doesn't give you the full rate increase or doesn't give you the rate increase at all. What, what, how would you go about thinking about the limiting of clinical services? So, um... I think it would be a mix. I think we'd have to look at the economic impact of some of these services that are, um, you know, we are subsidizing heavily and we would have to bring in our clinical leadership to help weigh out what is the um, impact to patient care in our community. Um, and there's no set methodology that we know of to do this, right? There's, you know, this is something that's a little bit art and a little bit science. We can quantify the economic uh, subsidy and loss, uh, and then we would work closely with our medical staff and our board and our other local so health and social service agencies because some of those have an impact. We provide in our community most of the specialty care uh, we don't provide any primary care, but you know we don't operate in a vacuum. So uh, if we looked at things like um, some things that don't generate a lot of margin, that could make it harder for our primary care partners to do their upfront prevention and management. Um, and the reality in Rutland is we have the highest Medicaid percentage of any county in the state. And the reality is for, for us around this table, for myself and Judy and Joe, if we can't get a service at Rutland Regional, we can get over to Dartmouth or to UVM or to other places down to Boston. Um, a significant part of our community cannot do that. Um, so we have looked at when we've done our planning and strategic planning and we've focused over the past two years. We've done a lot of focus on pandemic response, but we've also started to try to get our arms around this. And what we've determined is there's not a lot of services that we provide that wouldn't have a significant clinical impact if we stopped doing them. They'd help our bottom line significantly. So I don't have a clear game plan for you, to be honest with you, Jessica, about that. 
Um, mm. We'd have to put in place a methodology. And I, I want to be clear, we're not trying to come and hold anyone hostage or be alarmist like, hey, if you don't give us this, we're going to cut this. That is not what, contrary to some interpretation, that is not what we are saying. I think we'd have to go back. We're hoping uh, we laid out a, a clear case and the fact that our rate increases have been maybe overly conservative, as you mentioned and some of you mentioned in our budget piece. This is a time we've we've stepped up to the plate. This is a time that we, um, you know, we need some some relief. And I think, you know, we'd have to go back with Joe Krause and the board and ultimately the board will will make those determinations and put in place a methodology to say, hey, what do we need to do to balance the budget? And uh, those are going to be very difficult and painful and painful decisions because there's there's not a lot of stuff we're doing that doesn't have a significant impact uh, on people that we just can't do. And we've and as you've seen over the past several years when we have presented our budget, um, we've done some things on administrative and overhead to try to um, reduce that those areas and and I don't think there's a lot of room there so um, I don't know if I fully answered your question but that's that's our thinking. No I mean you that. did I, to be honest with you this is something that I've been testifying in both the House and the Senate about in the last couple of weeks about how and, and you know your presentation said it rate increases are increasingly becoming more ineffective um and the reality is that we're not on a sustainable path rutland is not alone in this um and to the degree that we don't start to think about different payment models and looking at the entire system and trying to find efficiencies across the entire hospital system uh, the reality is that hospitals are going to become more and more likely to have to cut essential services and i'm so my part of my curiosity was how are you thinking about cutting those services because it's a very challenging and difficult decision to make. And I, um, you know, I, I'd hate to think that it's all based on service line profitability because we know that, you know, the services that are least profitable are those that are, I know Rutland doesn't have primary care, but they tend to be primary care. They tend to be mental health. They tend to be those types of services. And that would but, be detrimental yeah, if there hospitals are a started lot of to cut those. Yeah, there are a lot of services that we provide, although it's not primary care. Um, there's a lot of, you know, when you really look and distill it down, uh, the economics of healthcare, which you know very well, there's a small group of things that subsidize a big group of, of essential services. Absolutely, we, I know. <laughs> I and, that. Yeah. you know, 12 years ago, in the middle of the opiate crisis, when there was no Medicaid assisted treatment program in Rutland County, and Project Vision, and Joe remembers this very clearly because he was the prime mover and chair of project, formative chair of Project Vision up until last year. Um, that was one of their early findings and Rutland stepped up to the plate. I don't take any, you know, my predecessors were very, and, and they put in place a medicated assisted treatment program for people suffering from substance use disorder. And it made a huge impact in this community wide ranging impact. And as a matter of fact, I would say it's hard to quantify it, but Westridge had a economic return that we don't see every day. Um, and it just gets kind of blended in, but you know, treating people, allowing them to, to hold down jobs and be present for their family, um, it, it's made a huge return. And, and our former chief Baker told me when I came to this community that, um, Claudio, when 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 Rutland, when I met him, he said, Claudio, when Rutland opened that property crimes went down uh, by 25 percent or something, you know, something along those lines. So so there are some of there's one example of something we're doing that has ripple effects. And I don't think we've seen it yet. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of studies out there uh, that see we now see what's happened when we've had to shut down essential services during this pandemic in an unprecedented way. And I'm hearing anecdotally, you know, when we don't do uh, routine colonoscopy screening, I'm hearing from our emergency department providers that anecdotally they're seeing more cancers, you know, two years later than they recall seeing. So I think we're going to see some studies and some some of the longer term impact that might not be 
very clear on Judy's balance sheet and, and income statement and projections, she's saying, but get kind of mixed into the cost of care um, in, in a community like like this, you know, that that's really, you know, post industrial and, and challenged and and so forth. So, I, so, so I, I, I'd like to add just another thought to that, um, because we can't think just about the bottom line. 30% of our volume is in the ACO. And if we are going to uh, reduce services that are going to impact our patients' access to care, it, it's it's going to be at risk in, in the ACO if, if they're not receiving treatment, delayed care, or going somewhere else. And so, you know, we really are thinking very holistically about these issues on both sides because we, we have competing and conflicting um, strategies with, you know, part of our service being fee for service, this being fixed. So um, it does it does provide for some interesting contrasts, um, and uh, you have to think about things a bit differently. Let me just ask another question around, uh, you know, as you as I mentioned, and you mentioned, you know, the rate increases on commercial side are, are going to become more and more ineffective. Have you reached out to Diva? to request uh, increases on the Medicaid side, since clearly that's one of the contributing factors to the shrinking operating margin, especially given the payer mix of Rutland Regional. What efforts have you made to reach out to DIVA to try and get some support? We, we, we have not reached out to DIVA to ask for a rate increase from them. Why? <laughs> Just out of curiosity. Well, and, and again, a significant part of our Medicaid volume comes through the ACO. I I I, I don't know. I think it's uh, we don't set uh, payment policy and 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 payment, and you know we reach out to Diva when there's a deviation from their established policy. But I I just never, you know, we can apply to Diva to say, hey, we need a rate increase. Uh, I don't know of any hospital. Well, I think done to that. the degree that that DIVA and Medicaid ha have to increase the understanding of the impact of not having their rates and their reimbursements keep pace with inflation. I mean, we're never going to, the, the cost shift is going to continue to increase if we don't, if hospitals don't continually also express the concern about those reimbursement rates not keeping pace with inflation. So, so, so we haven't reached out to DIVA, you know, they're the administrator, they, they follow the, the, guidance and the policy that's been set. What we have done, uh, Member Holmes, is that we have talked with our legislator, legislators quite extensively, especially over this past year. And uh, matter of fact, um, I got off a meeting this morning talking with some of them, with some of the hospital associations, talking to them about those concerns. So, you know, we've we've tried to go to the legislature to let them know what's happening on the front lines in hospitals, but we haven't talked to uh, to Diva specifically. Well, I'll just share that you know part of our, one of our recommendations out of the sustainability plan um, that we sent to the legislature that we've talked to the legislature about is is recommending that Medicaid keep pace with inflation um, because we recognize that this is a concern. Um, I guess my last question, if you could talk a little bit about, or actually maybe I'm thinking it might just be better in the interest of time if you could share um, some of the the analysis that you did on how you decided to to apply the requested rate increase to the certain services. I was a little bit confused, Judy, um, on the slide that you had, you listed clinical services and pharmaceuticals and laboratory. And I understand you're trying to balance, uh, you know, not increasing the cost of services that are ancillary to um, primary care, but I did see lab services on there and diagnostic on there. And then I also saw pharmaceuticals. I wasn't really sure you're saying you're increasing it on pharmaceutical, but trying to avoid things like endoscopy and, and some of the, you know, labs that would be supportive of primary care. So I wasn't really sure which services you were increasing. And I also, uh, you know, you talked about uh, using the hospital transparency data to look at your market position in those, uh, in particular services that you have chosen to increase the rates on. So I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share that analysis so we could see where the rate increase would be applied to and where the other hospitals are 
within those, uh, you know, where you'll fit within the distribution of rates after the rate increase on, on the rates that you're choosing to apply the rate request to. Yeah, we, we have a more, question make sense? <laughs> yeah, Judy has a more detailed schedule that she could she could get to you. Um, you know, what, what Judy and her team did was look at um, those areas that we were under the median for other um, PPS hospitals and in, in our service area in our region, and then um, uh, and and then we uh, applied a little bit of uh, thought. So lab services is one of those things. You know, um, those are the bread and butter day to day tools that our primary care docs have to keep people healthy and identify when they start getting out of whack, right? So, and that is one of the things that we hear from our, our physicians that, hey, you know, I'm flying blind when I ask my patient, or I ordered a lab for my patient and they don't get it because they say they can't afford it and that they don't really have the tools they need to do their job. So there's an altruistic thing. We recognize that and we've kept our lab charges are significantly below that's one area that we are below. We applied a little bit of rate increase to there because there's some room, um, but we don't want to make it harder to, to to take care of people and do the primary care upfront and prevention. And I recognize um, that. Yeah. And the other thing I think to balance is where are the uh, services where the copays and the deductibles are particularly high, and how does this, you know. How do these rate increases apply to the out-of-pocket costs that consumers in your area, patients in your area, are going to face? You know, so again, it's I I I see the challenge that you have. How do you balance community need, the copays and the deductibles, with needed margin? And how do you look at where to apply those rates? So I'm just a little bit more, you know, curious about what it what it boiled down to for all of you um, in your analysis. Judy, do you have uh, anything to add to that? Yes, it's it, we certainly can share. It's a very detailed analysis um, at the service level. Um, just to tie back a bit on the laboratory pricing, one of the reasons why we've been able to keep our rate increases low in prior years is we actually reduced lab prices and it took us about four years to get there. So if you model our lab prices against other Vermont hospitals, we are significantly uh, you know, lower. Uh, so we did take a, an opportunity there, but only, you know, a minimal opportunity. Um, but certainly we can share. Um, that is one of the benefits uh, of pricing transparency is you can look to see where you are um, in the market. Um, you know, and payer mix has a, has a you know, a, an application there as well, um, which is why you see most of the rate increase on the outpatient side um, with 70% of our inpatient volume being state and federal payers, um, you just don't generate uh, net revenue there. Great. My, my last and final question is, uh, have you invited staff members to contribute ideas for cost savings, just in terms of a staff survey that's gone out or any kind of like open box or something like that? Many organizations, I think, find innovative ideas come from those who are literally in the weeds and maybe seeing things that might be opportunities for cost savings. I'm just curious if you've reached out and done some sort of staff survey to solicit ideas. We we have not because up until really the past month, to be honest with you, we haven't been looking at cost. We've been looking at filling shifts. Um, how do we make sure that we have the staff so that we didn't have to go back to the well and shut down endoscopy, so that we didn't have to, that we could take those inpatient psychiatric patients. It was, it was really, um, so we have not pivoted that quickly to that because literally we were calling staff every day. Uh, we were looking at the beds that we had available three times a day, meeting every day, planning out whether we needed to cancel a surgery uh, that for the next morning, because we wouldn't have the bed availability or, you know, what it, what came out is we had beds, but we didn't have some of the staffing. And so we, we really spent our time um, literally up until last month on focusing on that, but we are pivoting quickly. And those are good ideas that we will. Um, and we've started this already by, as you can see, our costs have, have, uh, crested and going, our costs are going down from that slide Judy did. 
and we were pulling back. We're ratcheting down some of the incentive programs, um, and those are really hard decisions. But we will get to that where we'll, uh, you know, and we'll talk to our staff, but we'll also ask our managers, our frontline managers, where they see these opportunities. But I, I got to tell you, you that's no, a big that's a big pivot. I just the operate the reality of what we've been doing. You know, wait a second. Last month we were just get as many staff as you can, and now all of a sudden it's like, okay, cut costs. That's yeah. just the position that we're in. And I'll, I'll, you know, Judy and I think about this all the time, and our board is, you know, certainly aware of this. But the frontline managers were really, you know, the they haven't had a chance to take a breath and all of a sudden we're going to be pivoting and be like, it's all about cost now. Yeah, it, no, it's, I appreciate I, I appreciate yeah. the struggle. Trust me, I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but no, no, we will. We will, you know, that's where we're going to have to. That's part of our coming out of this thing. Rebuild workforce, look for areas we can address the financial impact that we're going to see over the next couple of years and going forward. Yeah, well, it's a tough time. I appreciate all the thought that's gone into this. I know it's not an easy ask. That's it for me, Jeff. We're going to turn to uh, our next uh, board member, board member Robin Lunge. Robin. Thank you. Um, the benefit of being third uh, is that I don't actually have a lot of questions. Most of my questions have been already asked and answered. Um, I do also want to echo Kevin and Jess's um, empathy towards your staff. We do realize uh, the frontline staff, as well as all of you have just been straight out. And so it's, um, it, it, but it is helpful to hear about how that's impacting uh, the hospital in these hearings. Cause I think uh, we can understand, but certainly hearing about it is very impactful. Um, my question, uh, that I have left is related to the pair mix on um, slide 14. Um, I was noticing that your self pay is very small at 1% um, and that there's a significant or fair, it's still small, but a uh, larger portion of 11% uh, that includes all other. And I'm wondering if you could just give us a little bit more description of what's in the all other. I would assume, for example, uh, maybe Medicare Advantage might be in there, but it, could you speak a little bit to that? Sure, that's exactly what it is. It's any other insurer that's not Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross, or self-pay. Um, so UHC, Aetna, Sing, Cigna, NVP, Workers' Comp, uh, all of those uh, roll up into that category. Would TRICARE be in there as well? Yes. Thanks. Sorry, Rob. No, that's OK. No, that's a great, great follow up. Um, all right, well, that was really the only question I had left. Uh, you've already answered my questions. I had questions about reserves, and um, I'm glad we'll be getting the analysis that you will share about the targeted to the rate increase, because that was an area of interest for me as well. Um, and thanks very much for coming in. Thank you, Robin. Uh, next, we're going to turn to board member Tom Pelham. Tom. You're muted, Tom. Sorry, um, I get the advantage of going forth and uh, most uh, most questions have been asked. Uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time kind of focusing on the uh, the kind of payer mix of uh, so so, kind of, so looking at looking at your your projected 2022 budget relative to your uh, approved fiscal 2022 budget um, there is a uh, 36.9 by uh, million or so million dollar increase in total operating revenues against a uh, 44.6 million dollar increase in total operating expenses um, relative to the operating revenues uh, about 7.4 million of that or exactly 7.4 million of that you know is from the the covid funding leaving uh, 28.7 million coming out of net patient service revenue 
And I'm wondering if the payer mix of that marginal increase in net payer revenue is substantially different from um, uh, kind of the underlying payer mix for the total budget that you submitted uh, and, and that we approved. Sure. Uh, so the short answer is no, it's not. We've seen a fairly stable payer mix. I will tell you the one change that is really directly related to COVID um, is that any patient who is seeking care here um, at the hospital with a COVID diagnosis, a COVID admission um, lab test, uh, if there is a balance on their bill, uh, that, that balance is written off. Um, and so regardless of uh, what type of insurance they carry, we do not balance bill for COVID. Um, that is related to our ability to uh, be eligible for some federal funding. Um, so that did have an impact in our payer mix, but not in the traditional sense in terms of who's enrolled in what program. So this is probably a question that definitely will get answered in our 2023 budget process, but just as possibly a preliminary, um, kind of looking at the increases um, in operating expense and operating revenues that are built into uh, this 2022 budget is, uh, do you have any sense about how much of those increases might be one time, you know, both on the revenue side and on the expenditure side so that, you know, we had or you have or we have some sense of whether or not there's a soft landing down the road or is, uh, are these increases going to get baked in? Um, and uh, both on the operating side and the revenue side, and um, uh, and, and and they are that they are some of them are one time in, in nature. Sure. So we're grappling with that as we speak. Uh, the senior leadership team met yesterday, looking at inpatient utilization and and understanding where that landing is. Uh, coming from a five month, uh, you know, utilization pattern where we saw 15 to 16 COVID patients a day. Um, and so uh, we do believe that utilization will come down. We do believe you'll see a softening of utilization in our 23 budget. Expenses will also come down. Um, I think, uh, you know, a, a simple um, uh, example is in our specimen collection center where we uh, perform all of our COVID testing. Uh, we had to amp up uh, staff there significantly. You'll see a significant decline um, in that patient or in that employee base uh, coming into our 23 budget. Places that we're having some difficulty um, is around facility access, workplace violence. Uh, those pieces have certainly, I'm sure you saw the article uh, in, in, in the Herald a couple of weeks ago, but that has to be top of mind for us, and we cannot uh, skimp on staffing uh, at the cost of not keeping our employees safe. And so we are looking at some of those costs uh, related to uh, patient and employee safety in our in our 23 budget. My final question uh, follows up on uh, a little bit one that just asked uh, or profiled having to do with the uh, payer mix. Uh, so what I understand is that the payer mix of, of, of the revenue increases that you've experienced, you know, is pretty much similar to what you ex expected or, or what the profile is of the underlying payer mix, which says to me that part of, of what we're dealing with here are uh, a, re a revenue source that doesn't cover its costs. And, um, and so we're in this classic position now of looking down the road to the commercial payers to, to pick up the tab. Um, you know, I think it's true for you that you don't have the freedom independently as a hospital to go to Diva and say, can you help us out? Um, can we adjust some? Uh, because those are statewide rates that are set. Every hospital fit pretty much, as I understand it, uh, faces the same kind of rate structure across the state. And so my uh, um, and and, I'm, you know, I've. I've for, for my own account, I've kind of taken a look, you know, at the vote of the emergency board having to do with the 2023 Medicaid um, appropriations. And it looks to me like they're baking in another cost shift for 2023. Um, I, you know, that, that needs to be tested, but it's something that 
the emergency board is the official embodiment of of the look down the road for for Medicaid statewide. And I would just urge you to um, with Vaz to be, to to make this payer mix issue and cost shift issue a, a fundamental um, uh, and aggressive um, uh, issue because it is structural um, and increment. And I think we've heard today that bit by bit this cost shift has put us in a position where we can't really go to the commercial folks anymore. It's gone too far. And uh, that argument, uh, I think, needs to be made to the powers that be. And, you know, and I think as a board member, we've got to think about ways that we can, you know, highlight it, um, maybe even baking in some assumptions about Medicaid increases that may or may not be real, but at least, uh, you know, putting the pressure on the powers that be to um, pay their fair share of the costs of, of operating our healthcare system. So um, I understand you can't call Dave up and say, help us out. That just is a, is, is a dead end. And uh, it's got to be done on a collective basis. So those are my thoughts and questions. And uh, I'll pass it along to the other Tom. Thank you, Tom. And before we go to the other Tom, I just want to say, Judy, from your, your lips to God's ears, I was knocking on wood when you said that you'd be able to ramp down the testing uh, in this coming year. I, I wish I shared your uh, total optimism that we were putting a, a lot of this behind us. Board member Walsh, Tom. Thank you, Chair, and hello, Claudio and Judy. Judy, it's nice to meet you. Um, I just want to echo a couple things. I want to express my appreciation of the effort you put in and the time you've taken to be here with us today um, and, ex and express um, empathy toward the exhaustion that you all must be feeling along with your staff. Um, I want to uh, appreciate the efforts that you showed in the presentation, um, efforts to rebuild the workforce, right? The retention and incentives. Um, I appreciate the targeting of the increases that you're asking for. And I uh, wanna echo uh, Jess's uh, request for more information about how that will be decided upon. Um, but your presentation outlined uh, a worrisome situation for, for sure. Um, the auditing report that you sent as part of part of this showed a good deal of reserves and I appreciate the explanation that you gave about starting to dip into those. Uh, the reserve in the auditing report was over $200 million. And I know that it's not always ap appropriate to compare family budgets to hospital budgets that can be misleading. But few of us have a proportional amount of reserve and we build our reserves because we may need it to pay for health care. Um, and so the questions of how much reserve is appropriate and when do you use it? I know there's not a scientific place to look to see that, um, but I think it's important to remember that the idea that service lines may close because the hospital can't afford to keep them open. We as a board need to balance that with the fact that um, the alternative is that people could be priced out and they lose out on healthcare that way. Uh, so that's the situation that we find ourselves in after an exhaustive uh, pandemic. And I appreciate your effort and um, appreciate you being here today. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Tom. At this point, we'll move to the healthcare advocate. Uh, Sam, are you asking the questions or is someone else? Good morning, Chair <clears throat> I actually don't have any questions at the moment, but I'm not sure if Eric does. And apologies, I still have my voice is very lost, a little bit sick at the moment. Eric, do you have questions? He said that he does not. Okay, are we having a uh, Communications problems again today with Eric. Uh, I'm not sure, but OK. Yeah, we're in so, close contact. We'll then um, move to uh, the staff uh, analysis and uh, I'll hold public comment till the end. Patrick. Right. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? I can. Thank you, Patrick. And Kim, can you hear me loud and clear? I can. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. 
Uh, thank you to the folks for Rutland for the uh, communication over the last couple of weeks and the uh, presentation this morning. Uh, so the staff has reviewed uh, a lot of the um, all of the documents that Rutland has sent over. But before we kick off here, I'm going to turn it over to our staff attorney, Russ McCracken, uh, to review some of the uh, items that the board uh, shall take into consideration and the following factors. So Russ, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I want to highlight here from the board's rule uh, 3401. Uh, these are some factors that the board takes into consideration in reviewing a budget either independently or uh, as is the case here when the hospital requests uh, an adjustment to their established budget. Um, a lot of these factors were covered uh, by Rutland in its presentation and, and the questions um, you'll find them uh, also touched on in the slides here. The uh, uh, variability of revenue uh, you'll see in the income statements in slide five and six of the staff presentation. Uh, the ability uh, of Rutland to limit services to meet its budget uh, was discussed and you'll also see it summarized here in slide 11. Uh, the financial position of the hospital relative to the overall system. Uh, you'll see some comparison metrics in uh, slide 10 of the staff presentation. Um, performance for the prior three years is summarized in slide seven and eight. And uh, the last one is a, a broad catch all for other considerations deemed appropriate by the board. Um, so wanted to highlight these as uh, factors to for the board to consider in uh, making its its um, uh, decision on the request. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Russ. Uh, so that was the framework by which we uh, <clears throat> built out our uh, review here and recommendation. Uh, so as you've heard, uh, kind of a recall here, uh, this has been in motion for some time with an initial letter coming from Rutland back in November, uh, but then their executive finance committee approving uh, their request uh, internally in mid-February, and then the letter was submitted to us in late February. Uh, the reason for the request, just to recap here, unanticipated demand for services and workforce challenges in recruiting, uh, recruiting and maintaining staff. Uh, these uh, challenges uh, are having an adverse effect on operating expenses that are projecting to exceed the budget by nearly $45 million. Uh, the margin erosion <clears throat> uh, is projected uh, due to the factors cited above. Uh, financial update uh, relating to uh, the current state of things. Um, the increased demand has generated projected gross and net patient revenues that are exceeding the approved budget by 9 and 10.8% respectively. Uh, other operating revenues are 37% over budget. We heard Rutland talk about some of the federal relief uh, that they've received that was unbudgeted uh, when, they're, uh, when they came before the board late last summer. Operating expenses uh, are driving the increase, are part of the dri are driven by increased demand, uh, workforce pressures, and rising costs. And these are projected at 15.3% over budget. And the result of that uh, operating margin <laughs> is currently being projected at uh, a loss of 755,000, a negative 2.3% operating margin, uh, and almost $7.7 .7 million variance from what was essentially a break even budget. So just recapping some of the uh, uh, financial updates uh, as it relates to the budget that was approved by the Green Mountain Care Board back in September. The request is a 9% uh, change in charge rate to gross charges uh, for specific services from the 3.6 before that 3.64, excuse me, that was approved in September of 2021 uh, and Rutland has requested uh, that this new rate would be effective April 1st. So essentially they would operate uh, with six months at their init initial approved rate and six months at the requested rate, should it be approved. And you can see here some of the impact of uh, the projection with and without uh, this request. Uh, so essentially it's adding about $7.4 million from the current projection. Uh, the financial impact as well, the total gross revenue due to the impact, uh, the rate only is an increase of about 31.8 million. Uh, and this essentially equates to $7.4 million impact in MPR. And we rounded up, so our numbers will be slightly different than what Rutland projected. So we have uh, essentially the 1% value is roughly equal to $822,000. Uh, 
Uh, if approved, this would make gross and net patient and fixed prospective payment revenues projecting to exceed budget by 14 and 13 and a half percent. Uh, if if approved, no change is projected in operating expenses that would still be running essentially at 15.3% over budget. And if approved, the operating margin situation improves dramatically uh, with a loss of $187,000, <clears> which would be uh, a difference of almost $309,000 from their approved budget. Here are some of the figures just to highlight some of those uh, financial updates and impacts that we've shown. We took some of their first quarter information. As Judy mentioned, they had submitted that, that to us. So uh, as of December, uh, the hospital had a net operating loss of uh, just over $1 million. And you can see here, we've built, also built in uh, the current projection that they provided us and <clears throat> the projection with the rate increase to kind of uh, uh, tie together the different perspectives uh, as the situation has evolved for Rutland. On the next slide, very similar look, also applying some variances on the far right uh, to provide some perspective here. And you can see uh, the variances that I just spoke to uh, specifically around uh, net operating income <clears throat> and the changes from budget that would result and also the changes uh, with gross revenue and net, fix, uh, net patient revenue and fixed perspective payments. Uh, still, uh, even with the rate increase, uh, Rutland would be exceeding budget in a significant way. And as we discussed uh, last week at our fiscal year interview, uh, budgeting in this current environment is very difficult. And so we are seeing some extremely large variances occurring in that space. Uh, but we can see here too some of the operating margin and total margin uh, percentages that are the result of some of these projections. So we thought it was important to provide a history here and some context. Uh, Rutland Regional, from an NPR and FPP perspective, looking back over the last several years, has pretty much operated in the range, the mid $200 million range. And to really highlight uh, some of the growth that they were talking about, you can see this is a hospital that uh, is currently moving very rapidly towards the $300 million threshold, which having operated in that mid 200 space for uh, several consecutive years really highlights uh, the growth that they are uh, experiencing and the demand for their services. <clears throat> And so we wanted to provide some context in that regard to show that uh, this is very, very real for this organization. And it's uh, it's definitely out of the ordinary uh, when Rutland operated in that mid 200 range between uh, 240 to 256 million dollars. And now we're seeing some pretty sizable uh, year over year increases in the experience that they're having and for their services. Building a similar look, but with the projected projection and rate increase again, uh, this would put the hospital over the $300 million threshold, which stands in stark contrast to where they've operated traditionally. And of course, what that also means is that uh, this revenue is not completely free and clear. There are operating expenses that are are following those revenue growth paths. So the hospital is traditionally operated. Uh, at levels much, much lower from an operating pers uh, expense perspective. And now they're having to uh, wrestle with uh, the growing costs that are outstripping their capacity to generate revenue. And as uh, Judy and Claudio uh, exhibited, uh, they've for the most part been operating with some pretty thin margins um, and also uh, some pretty low uh, rate increases over the last couple of years. Now we know that those are not uh, tied one for one to each other, uh, but if we strip out fiscal year 2021 that we have here, knowing what we know based on the discussion that we had just last week, uh, that that is predominantly a, a positive margin due to uh, provider relief funding, uh, that from a true operating perspective, this hospital has been making do with some pretty slim margins and relying heavily on its capacity to adjust their business model uh, as the situation uh, requires. So they've been profitable, probably not as profitable as they'd like to be, but they have not uh, <clears throat> produced any losses in that respect. And, and the capacity for leadership to maintain narrow margins is, is a pretty big challenge and probably not one that we can measure in the work that we do here. Uh, so there, there, there needs to be a recognition of that capacity as well. 
Uh, so that tells us on the finance side that the situation that they've brought to us as it relates to workforce challenges and rising costs means that even with their experience capacity to manage to some narrow margins, it has gotten to a point where uh, it is very difficult for them <clears throat> to do that without some needed flexibility in that financial space. We had the conversation already about some of the reserves uh, and to Judy's point, yes, there is a certain amount of padding that has gone on in days cash on hand as we've acknowledged through several uh, series of discussions over the last couple of years due to advances and provider re refunding and how hospitals treat that. Uh, however, it's important to understand too that uh, reserves are usually uh, much more easily used up than they are replaced. And when you look at some of the margins that Rutland is producing here in this environment, they would likely uh, bring their reserves down should they begin to dip into them at a much faster rate than they could replace them. And so when you get into that space, uh, that level of what is an acceptable amount of reserves can be whittled away very, very quickly. So we need to be cognizant of that fact as well. And we have to remember if those reserves are in investments, yes, they are susceptible to uh, stock market forces, but as they're whittled down and the principal balance of that is reduced, the capacity for those investment balances to spin off uh, income that can be used to uh, backfill some operational uh, setbacks becomes less and less. And so it can be a slippery slope when we get into that space of what's acceptable and should they depend on their reserves at this time. Uh, so just want to be completely upfront and objective about that space. Uh, <clears throat> but for the most part, uh, Rutland's age of plant is is uh, pretty much in the median space, maybe a, a little older than most of the hospitals in Vermont. Uh, but again, without the capacity to produce a meaningful uh, margin, that inhibits their capacity to reinvest in some of their assets and asset replacement and what have you. And then if that is not able to be done through operating margin, they have to go into their reserve space to be able to do that because there are returns that can be made from improving your uh, asset position and replacing assets. So uh, it's none of it happens in a vacuum. It is all tied together. Uh, and when you find yourself in a position where Rutland is at, it can become uh, a little precarious uh, to balance that out. And it is an immense challenge as we've heard this morning. So looking at the rate history here, uh, the original five-year rate as it would stand as of the uh, approvals for fiscal year 22 budget, and then uh, what it would be should the 9% uh, be approved by the board here. Now, I want to Put some context to this because this is a look that we've provided over the last couple of years in the lower right hand corner and you can see here by some of our numbers on the average and median that rutland is about middle of the pack however that is uh that is heavily influenced by the information on the left hand side of the screen that in 2017 they actually had a negative 5.1 percent uh reduction to rate uh and that fell off and so the weight there of a, a relatively small increase of 3.64 carries with it with that backfill of five years a little bit more significance than it otherwise would. And when we looked at our presentation from last budget cycle, uh, Rutland was higher up on this scale here, which means their five year average and median were much, much lower. So the five year look is great to grab some context, but it's not a perfect look is what I'm saying here. So we can see. Uh, in the upper right hand corner that if approved uh, the combined weighted increase that is six months at uh, 3.64 and six months at the proposed 9% would put Rutland at about 8.14% for uh, fiscal year 22 once it's completed. And of course that would boost their uh, five year average and five year median uh, significantly as it relates to their uh, peers within the state. <clears throat> So you've heard uh, that uh, Rutland uh, responded to some of our questions. We thank them for that. Uh, they were very prompt in doing so uh, and attentive. Uh, but some of the questions we had, and we've talked about some of these so far about uh, confirming the request is able to be implemented under third party payer contract. They did acknowledge in their uh, letter to us <coughs> uh, in their response to us that that had not been done as of their February 25th, 2022 uh, letter to us and also uh, Mr. Fort had acknowledged that as of this morning and their logic as to why. 
Um, we asked, uh, what is Rutland's contingency plan if not approved? And what is your ability to limit services to meet your budget consistent with its obligations to provide appropriate care? We've we've heard some of that too. So we filled in some of the responses that we received from Rutland. Uh, one of the most concerning financially would be that they do trigger a debt covenant. Uh, <clears throat> it's likely that, uh, and I'm not going to speak out of turn, but in my experience working in the commercial space that uh, a, an operator uh, such as Rutland, it likely would not result in a calling of the loan as in calling in the debt. Uh, there's probably some other mitigating factors, but certainly uh, once a lending institution uh, recognizes a debt covenant, covenant violation, uh, things can change uh, significantly. That is often seen as lenders as kind of an early warning sign that they need to begin to pay more attention to the borrower. So <clears throat> just want to level set in that space that that is a, a significant concern for both uh, the borrower being Rutland and any and their lenders, which they described to us. Um, Rutland does believe that their services are in alignment with their community's needs uh, and without the rate increase, Rutland may have to limit services as was discussed earlier. Um, <clears throat> we understand also along with the discussion here that uh, rate is certainly not everything and we would expect based on the past history of Rutland's ability to manage their services that they would make every attempt to right size as necessary without having to limit those services. And lastly, um, Rutland's mid-year rate request having impact on wait times issues, we wanted to make sure that uh, there wasn't going to be uh, any significant impact there. <clears throat> Rutland said, no, this was not going to be the case. Uh, this request was entirely due to the need to respond to inflationary costs related largely to workforce. So that all said, our recommendation here uh, is that Rutland has uh, demonstrated to us that uh, this 9% is necessary. And so we recommend that they, we approve the 9% uh, requested increase to mitigate projected margin erosion and to provide the hospital leadership the financial flexibility to meet the unforeseen circumstances resulting from increased volumes, workforce, and other cost pressures. The approval of 9% would create an overall rate change of 8.14%. Uh, from 2021 for Rutland Regional because we are in fiscal year 2022. So wrapping up our uh, recommendation is based on the fact, as I said, that the pressures that this particular hospital uh, is facing could not have been foreseen back in uh, August or September. Uh, they've shown a demonstrated capacity to operate that hospital uh, to meet the needs not only of their community, but also to maintain a stable financial position in an environment that has become increasingly unstable, uh, but the time has come uh, for them to uh, be provided a little bit of financial flexibility to meet uh, the, vulner the volatility, excuse me, that is being exhibited in that space currently. Uh, and so as we've done in the past here, we do have some suggested motion language for the board to uh, help uh, ease uh, any motion that a board member would like to make uh, in advance of a vote. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Patrick. And I know that uh, we're limited on the amount of time that we have the folks from Rutland. So um, I would ask if you and staff could uh, just forward to the board your calculations on how you came to the 8.14%. Are there questions or comments from board members for staff? I actually just have uh, two quick ones, Kevin, if I may. You may. Okay. One was, uh, Patrick, if you could just work with Judy on slides five and six um, on the projected total margin. It sounds like there's an additional $4 million loss from investment income that would, if I understand it, would increase the total margin loss. So they wouldn't be the same. If that's correct, Judy, am I am I interpreting this right? So I was on mute. Yes, I, I can work okay. with on that. Okay, that would be fantastic. It would just be helpful to know what the projected tr total margin is. Um, and then my other comment, um, Patrick, is just on slide ten, where we do the uh, change in charge comparison across hospitals. 
this is a slide you know that we've seen before and that we've used before but i guess my request would be given uh the way that the uvm health network does their effective commercial rate versus their change in charge my request would be if we could have both up there side by side where we actually factor in what the effective commercial rate request was from those three hospitals simply because for example the asterisks there pmc has been zero since 2017 um, that that doesn't actually jive with what the effective commercial rate requests were over that time period. For example, in 2017, it was 5.3 percent was PMC's effective commercial rate request. So I just think it's it would be helpful to see both. I recognize this is accurate because their change in charge request is different than their effective commercial rate request. But if we're really trying to do a comparison, and I again recognize it's still not apples to apples, but it would be helpful. So small request um, going forward. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Certainly, we can do that. We specifically left that out uh, because we wanted the focus to be on Rutland only, but we can certainly do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? I have um, a quick one. So I obviously, uh, if we were to approve a change in charge increase, that will have an impact on the NPR budgeted for this year and I, the the request that I would have is for staff um, to think about whether we should also be approving if we do approve a change in charge would we also approve a change in the NPR otherwise uh, it it seems like the historical comparisons get a little tricky so if staff could think about that that would be helpful I mean, just so I'm clear, are you referring only to Rutland or for the system as a whole? Well, only to Rutland right now, right? Because that's the request we have in front of us. Obviously, it will impact the system as a whole comparisons, but just having that information for Rutland would be helpful right now. Okay. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment at this time. Does any member of the public wish to comment mm -hmm. on the uh, request by Rutland Regional Medical Center? And I am going to call on Sarah Teachout first. Thank you, Sarah Teachout, representing Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, Chair Mullen and members of the Green Mountain Care Board, during your consideration of the Rutland Regional Medical Center's mid-year budget request, potential other mid-year asks and the upcoming annual hospital budgets you will consider this summer, please remember the Vermonters who are paying these staggering bills. The voices from the rate review public hearing were clear and their stories were consistent in their message. Vermonters are outraged and asking why their costs are increasing year over year. As members of the Green Mountain Care Board, you must draw a very clear line between the hospital budget increases you are considering today and the out-of-pocket costs for patients, claims cost for employers, and premium increases that will follow this decision. A fundamental basis of the all-payer model agreement is that the cost increases must be kept below 3.5%. We make every attempt to do this on behalf of our members in our annual contract negotiations, while at the same time balancing access challenges that are paying, playing out right now in a very painful way for Vermonters. The Green Mountain Care Board accepted Rutland Regional's original 3.64% budget request, but a 9% increase now that will result in an 8.14% increase over the 12-month period is a significantly different story. Just last week, your staff provided an eye-opening snapshot of the 2021 hospital financial results that demonstrated a very strong year for 13 of our hospitals. Rutland Regional had its strongest operating margin in five years, coming in $2.8 million better than its next closest year in 2017. At the end of FY 2021, they projected a surplus of $261 million, and yet, they are requesting a 9% raise from commercially insured Vermonters. Blue Cross holds about 135 million in reserves for all of the lives we cover. Um, 
our members are using those reserves right now to cover all the costs of mm. COVID testing and treatment. With this surplus, why are they not funding their increased needs through their own reserves? Why must the consequences of these decisions always fall on the commercially insured ratepayers? I would also say that everything that Patrick Looney spoke about on reserves also applies to insurer reserves. One sec, I gotta. <laughs> Member Holmes just this week testified to the legislature that Medicaid and Medicare reimbursements are not keeping pace with inflation and the current strategy of relying on commercial rates paid by the privately insured to cover these rising health care costs is no longer viable or sustainable. Even the Green Mountain Care Board approved higher and higher commercial rates. There are not enough privately insured Vermonters to afford them. We wholeheartedly agree and that continuing to pass these costs along unconditionally to the shrinking pool of the commercial payer is not an option. The Green Mountain Care Board needs to hold hospitals accountable for meeting their annual budgets and balancing both cost pressures and expenses. No one is emerging from the pandemic unscathed. Vermonters and the employers we need to manage need to manage within their limited budgets and resources. Vermonters do not have the ability to ask for 9% mid-year wage increases and hospitals should not have that ability either. Thank you for considering our comments. Sarah, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but since Rutland has not asked you, um, would Blue Cross um, grant the 9% if it was given? And would that impact um, discussions for next year's uh, budgets and rates? Uh, so Chairman Mullen, I can't say whether or not we would grant the 9%. Um, we haven't begun talking to them about it at all, um, but certainly it would uh, impact rates. Thank you, Sarah. Next, I'm going to call on Joe Kraus. Joe? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, it was not my intention to speak, but hearing the discussion has unfolded, I feel compelled. <clears throat> First of all, um, so everyone knows, I've served on the board of the Rutland Regional Medical Center for seven years, the last two as chair. Um, you have a very hard job to do as the Green Mountain Care Board. Virtually impossible, given the conflicting forces that you must balance. And I'd just like to thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> we know this is not an easy job. Today, the focus has been exclusively on costs. I'd like to say a couple of things that are, that are my colleagues wouldn't. You also have to consider what do you get for those costs? And in Rutland Regional, I think our community gets a great value. There are only two hospitals in Vermont that have achieved uh, magnet certification by the N Nursing Association of America, <clears throat> Rutland and Southwestern Vermont. Those are rare achievements, and it is critical to our at attracting and keeping sound nurses. So when we talk about the things we're doing with the dollars that you have maybe giving us, we are investing them in the best way we have. In addition, one of the best measures for uh, hospital function is its safety rating. And when you look at the all of Vermont's hospitals, I think there's 13, the hospital with the highest safety rating by far, based upon the leapfrog analysis every year, is the Rutland Hospital. So as we ask for additional funding here, I want you to take some comfort in knowing that these dollars can be spent carefully and thoughtfully and not frivolously and we're going to provide the best outcome to our communities we possibly can. Having said all that, <clears throat> the system we have, as you acknowledge, is not sustainable. Uh, if Medicare continues to, to pay at the rate it does and Medicaid, uh, we'll all be gone. And for, for some hospitals, that's a possibility because when you look at the Vermont landscape, most of Vermont hospitals are within an hour of a major medical center. That is not true of our little hospital in Rutland. If our hospital had to cut services, which is typically the first thing you would do, our patients would have to drive great distances to either Albany, Burlington, or Hanover, well over an hour to get services. 
That's not true of other hospitals in Vermont. In fact, it may not be true of any other hospital in Vermont. So cutting services for us is not something we take lightly. And in fact, I, I can assure you that all the questions that the care board asked today of Claudio and Julia and Ju Julie, excuse me, Judy, they've heard from their board of directors time and time again. So the, the, if we can't cut services effectively, the only thing we can do is really work to get our community as healthy as it possibly can so they don't find themselves in our emergency department or in our sur surgical suites. To that end, we're doing something that I think no other hospital in Vermont is doing. And again, ap I apologize for bragging, but you need to understand this. We are working our butts off to form what is called the Rutland Health Alliance in conjunction with both uh, the community health care services, all the, the family doctors in the Rutland region, as well as Rutland Mental Health. To, we're forming something called the Rutland Health Alliance. It doesn't make headlines. It's not real sexy, but it is our belief that the only way that we are going to be sustainable is to have a community that needs our services to a lesser degree than they do now. Basically working hard to achieve the one care model that the Green Mountain Care Board and the, and the state of Vermont has said the direction we're going in. We've already allocated $500,000 to that effort. $500,000 we really don't have, so if you heard today, because we think it is so important to the future of our organization. And, um, and I can tell you that this effort is going to take more dollars in the near term. Hopefully in the longer term, it will save us costs and provide a better community. So I just want to conclude again by thanking you, letting you know that whatever you give us will be, a, will be put to great use. We are going to continue to provide outstanding services for every dollar we get, and we're going to work hard to find solutions to what is currently uh, an unsustainable arrangement. Uh, I don't know what more you can ask of us. So uh, thank you so much again, and a thank you, Kevin, for the opportunity for a couple of minutes of uh, commentary. Thank you, Joe. Next, we'll turn to Sam Peisch from the Healthcare Advocates Office. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll keep it brief because I know we're at 10 o'clock. Um, just a couple of concerns. I worry about the precedent that risks being set by, at least in part, responding to what I would say are periodic, often cyclical, and historically inevitable downturns in market performance, just speaking to the investment returns. And it's also concerning to me that it seems like our MC does not have a contingency plan if this charge request is not approved beyond the only alternative proposed change being cutting services for Vermonters. And just to remind, I mean, I think everyone is hopefully acutely aware, but it bears repeating, these charge requests are shouldn't be considered just in a vacuum. It's beyond just simply ensuring stable operating margins and profitability. If this charge request is improved, we're in practice deciding that some of these factors are more important than ensuring affordability, which is of course a continuing concern to us and I think to others. Um, board comments speaking to the unsustainability and diminishing effectiveness of these rate increases over time also to me speaks to the importance of studying the utility of transitioning to global budgets and I want to thank the board for considering this shift. Thanks a lot. Back to you chair. Thank you Sam. Other public comment? Hearing none, I know that we've surpassed the 10 o'clock uh, time limit that you had uh, Claudio and Judy and uh, I apologize for that. Um, clearly, we'll uh, finish our discussion um, for today here, but we'll come back to this um, as soon as um, we can get everybody's uh, schedule to align. My guess is that's going to be next Wednesday, but Claudio um, Kara Christ from our staff will be reaching out to um, figure that out, and hopefully we can have a conclusion for your request one way or the other uh, next Wednesday. Appreciate it. Appreciate the time today and for your consideration. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Judy. Yes, thank you. With that, does any board member have any uh, old business? Does any board member have any new business? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Uh, 
Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great St. Patrick's Day. May the luck of the Irish be with everyone today.